Okay, Monica is still with us? Yes, I'm here. All right, great. I've got 1 o'clock. Do you want to go ahead and get started? I think that sounds great. Cool, let's do it. Well, good afternoon everyone on the East Coast and good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's Boomerang webinar, 10 Tips to Ensuring Long-Term Sustainability in the Nonprofit Arena. My name is Stephen Shattuck and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Boomerang and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And today I'm joined by our guest, Monica Gold, uh, MBA CMC. Uh, hey there, Monica. How are you doing? Awesome. How are you? Good. Thanks for being with us. For those of you who don't know Monica, she's the president and founder of Strategic Consulting Partners. Uh, she has over 30 years of senior leadership experience, uh, specifically in the financial management and strategic planning uh, arenas. She's worked with um, uh, big companies, large, uh, small companies, and uh, uh, helped out with a lot of multi-million uh, dollar uh, operations. She actually has an MBA from American University, and she is an award-winning certified management consultant. Uh, in fact, only 1% of management consultants have achieved that designation. So Monica, this is a real treat to have you here to uh, share all your expertise with us. So uh, thanks again. This should be fun. It should be fun. Well, yeah. thank you, everyone. So, so what we're going to do today, um, just a little bit of house cleaning before Monica takes over. Um, we're going we're gonna to run through her presentation and uh, as always we're going to jump right into a, a Q&A session uh, after her slides. So if you hear anything that maybe you'd like explained or if you have any questions about uh, sustainability or financial planning for nonprofits, anything on your mind for Monica at all, do send those questions uh, our way through the chat box right there on your screen. And I'll see those, and Monica will see those too, and we'll try to uh, answer just as many as we can uh, here and before the two o'clock hour. Um, so don't be afraid to do that, and um, just know that we will be sending out the slides and a recording of the full presentation a little later this afternoon. So if you have to bounce early, uh, don't worry, uh, you won't miss any content uh, that you can't watch a little later on. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Monica, why don't you take it away for us? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to, uh, to be working with you and to be sharing some tips on financial sustainability. So I'm sure that as many of you that are in the nonprofit sector understand that uh, the nonprofit sector is not what it was two, three, five years ago from a financial standpoint. And there have been a lot of things happening in our economy that have been impacting that. Um, so the first objective is going to be to understand the state of the nonprofit sector in today's economy. What does it look like, and what does that then mean to you as leaders of those uh, nonprofits in terms of creating long-term viability? So I, I'd say no, my number one request from clients when I'm working with them on strategic planning is help me figure out how to diversify my revenue, help me figure out how we can be long-term sustainable in light of the fact that our funding streams keep changing. So um, we'll be talking about some of those strategies, some of the things that you can do to develop them, and some of the conversations you're going to have. Um, clearly this is a huge topic and you know, 45 minutes or so is, is not going to cover it all, but my hope to you is that we provide you with some realistic things to think about and come up with a plan so that you can move uh, your organizations forward. All right, so <clears throat> we have done a lot of work with various nonprofit organizations, including PANO, uh, Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations, and including uh, nonprofits for New Jersey, the Center for Nonprofits in New Jersey. And this data, the next couple of slides actually come from them. This has been updated uh, for the current state of affairs. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. I just think it's important for you to see what's happening from a community standpoint. So as you notice here, high level on this slide is that if you look at the source of funding, um, the decrease of funding sources is kind of listed by the, the various uh, types of funding sources. So local government is still funding, county government is still funding, but as you notice, all government, including uh, federal government, is decreasing. And in fact, I will say that I have seen probably in the last two years more on the federal government and state government side decreased than we had in previous years. United Way has decreased um, in, in uh, terms of organizations that put on private events, you know, whether it be galas or golf events or things like that. We've seen reductions on uh, revenues coming from there. 
So if you kind of look at it across the, the board, probably corporate donations and private foundations have been hit the hardest. Uh, but you will see that, that in terms of decreases, it's coming from every source. Not to scare you, we got ideas and strategies. Okay? So the next slide kind of outlines um, some reactions that organizations have had to these changes. So clearly, our first thought is, oh my gosh, we need to get additional funds. We got to get funds from somewhere else because if we lost that state grant or we lost that um, you know that fundraiser that we used to do, and we used to make five or six thousand dollars from it. How are we going to how are we going to come up with the funds to keep things going? So you can see by and large that organizations are really looking at seeking alternative funding, have, coming up with new fundraising ideas. Are the two biggest um, two biggest growth areas that we see. The other key thing that I think is important for you to note is that collaboration and partnerships have become um, critical in the fundraising arena in that the collaborations and partnerships really open up the door for a couple organizations to work together that have synergy in their mission and be able to go after funding and secure funding together. So we've seen that as a huge trend and that has really um, positioned organizations to be viable um, for the future. So if you notice the other kinds of things that have happened, less so, um, as, as you probably have experienced within your organizations, you do more with less. So freezing salaries is a, is a strategy, cutting staff, but, but you know, when we do these kinds of things, we have to note that uh, there will be an ultimate um, impact to our program services and the quality of our programs. So, so nonprofits have been really trying to work um, in figuring out alternative ways to, to raise their operating budget so that they can continue. Uh, next is if you think about how to improve the sector, some of, some of the key things that strategies that are happening right now is capacity building. Most local community foundations uh, and a lot of um, foundations like even Forbes you know, Fund and, and different foundations provide uh, capacity building grants. That's a grant by which you go in and say, I'd like to do strategic planning, I'd like to come up with a long-term financial strategy, and I'd like someone to help me to do that because we don't have that, that capacity uh, in-house. So um, a lot of organizations, a lot of foundations are putting, putting money in there because what that does is it builds the infrastructure for the organization for long-term uh, sustainability. So that is kind of the big, the foundation funding and capacity building is really happening in that arena. So I won't get into too many details because I definitely want to make sure we're spending the time on the positives in terms of how we can move it forward. Um, as you probably have experienced for yourself, you've probably seen a demand uh, for increased services, especially in um, some of the service areas, like uh, in the areas of people with disabilities, in the areas of, of human services, uh, potential welfare connections, domestic violence. Those, those areas have actually increased in, in terms of the demand. There is a, there's a clear, clear link between poverty and issues associated with uh, financial, personal financial sustainability to, um, to uh, excuse me, personal financial sustainability to services that are, that are requested from nonprofits. So, um, you, you'll probably have seen not only those increases, but then also a simultaneously dramatic um, increase for or decrease in funding and an increase of need for new funds. Okay, that being said, um, these are the 10 tips that I, that I have come up with, and I will tell you this is what I use when I work with clients in helping them to move forward in terms of long-term sustainability. And they may apply for you. Um, they may not all apply for you, but I'd say for the most part, I, I haven't seen one organization that these generic tips are not applied to. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through each and every one of these in a little bit more detail so you can see what we're, what we're talking about. So the first one, developing a long-term strategic plan. So if you don't have one, um, 
you know, you should really consider thinking about where are we going in the next three to five years. So the plan, can, the plan actually serves as a roadmap. It should be a living, breathing document. It's not something that you know you do and you stick on the shelf and you never look at it again. Um, and a lot of you know a lot of complaints that people have with strategic planning is it is just that it's just this heady thinking conversation, and we really don't have anything that's actionable from it. For nonprofits, especially, I think it's important to make sure we're all clear on what your mission is. Um, who are you? Who do you serve? Where are you located? And and how do you serve? Do you serve through education? Do you serve through one-on-one -on -one services? All of that is important, not only to um, be clear, you know, to your organization, but also be able to communicate potentially to funders, to uh, stakeholders in the future, to potential board members, and to current board and staff as to what you're doing. If you have a really refined and defined mission, it really helps you to make better decisions about what programs and services you provide in the future. So when you know when you're up against this huge grant and it's asking you to um, you know potentially add six new programs and services, and they're not giving you any operational expenses to bring those on. They're just giving you programmatic dollars to run those. You have to kind of look at it and say, okay, are these programs and services they're asking me to do fit in with my mission? If not, what do I need to do to adjust my mission? Do I want to adjust my mission? If, if the answer to that is no, then it's a pretty easy way for you to say, you know what, this probably isn't the best fit for our organization. Um, one of the biggest challenges I see with nonprofits is they chase the almighty dollar. And so, when a grant comes available or they see something that might be available, they're, you know, you guys are entrepreneurs, you really try to do whatever you can and get money from whatever sources. Sometimes we have a tendency to do things that are not in our niche or not in our um, sweet spot and we end up diverting a lot of time and resources into things that are not mission critical. So that's the first point. The second point is really developing that vision. Where do you see yourself in the future? Where do you want to be three, five, ten years from now? And you know, kind of having that that model for yourself in in your head as an organization and as a board, so that you can then quickly respond to what the marketplace is asking and to see whether or not it fits within where you're going. So many of you have probably heard of the concept of a SWOT analysis. Part of strategic planning and part of the thing that you ought to do before you ever walk in the door for a strategic planning re retreat, and you notice that I say before you ever walk in the door. One of the biggest challenges nonprofits have um, when they're doing strategic planning is they go after, you know, we need someone to facilitate strategic planning for the day. And they hire a facilitator, a meeting facilitator, that can help you to, to structure conversations and have interesting conversations. However, those conversations are often had in a vacuum, and they're not based upon anything that's real to your organization. So we encourage you um, prior to is to do some sort of SWOT analysis. You can, you can facilitate a SWOT conversation at the meeting. But it's important that you have a clear understanding before you walk in the door, especially if you are um, board leadership or you're you know, a leader in the organization, to be able to see what are the strengths, strengths and weaknesses of our operation. Now, you know the strengths and weaknesses are the internal components. So it could be about your staff. It could be about your programs. It could be about your location. It could be about your volunteer capacity. Uh, could be about you know your admin support. A lot of different components. So we're looking for what are your strengths in the organization and what are the weaknesses. In terms of opportunities and threats, these are external to you. These are opportunities that hey, we have an opportunity to, to leverage a relationship with the partnership and enhancing communities. That's an opportunity that could bring us um, you know both revenue and, and both grants. So that's something you might want to pursue. Um, threats, on the other hand, are things that make you vulnerable, things that might be out there. Maybe a new organization that's coming into your backyard. Maybe a closure of a uh, large funding source. 
maybe the law system some core uh, personnel and or um, board members and volunteers. So these are things that could happen to you that could potentially create vulnerability in the organization. The purpose of the SWOT analysis is, is very simple. It's, it's helping you to understand the current state of position. Where are you and where are there levers and where are there constraints and where are there problems we need to address. Taking the, the, the details from the SWOT analysis to see kind of where your gaps are from between your strengths and your weaknesses and where those opportunities and threats are, this is the basis for your plan. This is how you're going to go address the, the major components of your plan. So it is very critical. So once you have done that, and, and I encourage you again to do all of that before you get to your retreat, um, or at least that analysis component. So we think about strategic planning and the visioning component. The vision is where you're going in the future. You can see that at the top of the pyramid. The purpose and the mission is defining our day-to-day. -day. Who are we? That's what we talked about. Those two things should be discussed and talked about and at least pulled through surveys or through focus groups or through different things prior to your retreat. And then you can facilitate conversations around those and, and refine those. Um, those your vision and mission and purpose. Values, um, these are your guiding principles that drive your business. So what are they? Uh, and, and often they're value statements. They're not necessarily just words. Uh, I like to look at them as, as actions and not just as nouns. So what are those values and then, and then how do they translate into how you deliver service and how you interact with the community and how you interact with your staff and your and your internal stakeholders. Then we're ready to develop goals. Um, you'll notice then we we'll talk about objectives. Goals are very high level things, so they would be maybe a goal around fundraising diversity, a goal around program quality, a goal around staff development, maybe a goal around board development. They're fairly high level. They're not smart goals. They're not specific. The objectives are the four or six or ten strategies, whatever it may be, that you want to undertake for that goal uh, in order to be accomplished. And those objectives should be um, should be stretched out over a longer period of time. So, so if you have a, a plan for fundraising diversification by the year you know 2018, let's say, is what you're working on. If your objectives are all front loaded and everything has to get done in the year 2014 and 15, it's probably not that solid of a plan. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have we probably have some that are front loaded, but some that are ongoing tasks, and the ability to add new objectives as your plan evolves. So as you as you start implementing some of your key first objectives, the first you know years objectives. Maybe adding additional ones after that year that w would still tie into the same goal. It doesn't change your goal, your mission, your vision, or your values. It just looks at an additional and new strategies that you're going to undertake to get to where you need to get to. And the tactics for the specific actions. I mean, you know, Sally goes to X meeting on X date and accomplishes Y by, you know, uh, T time. Okay, so it's it's very very specific. And that'll be that'll be the driving um, factor behind whether or not you're accomplishing things. Okay. So that is high level strategic planning in five minutes. All right. So so we talked about strategic planning as being such a critical part to really knowing where you're going. Um, the second critical piece, the second tip we have here is refining your organizational structure and your organizational plan. And I will tell you that this, if you are not, if you don't have the right people on the bus or you haven't looked at how your organization structure might need to change and ebb and flow over time, you've missed the boat. Um, things are changing around you constantly. Funding is changing around you. The needs that you might have within your staff may have differed, may differ now than what it was two years ago or five years ago. You should constantly be looking at what what is the structure, what is the performance management plan and structure, how you evaluate the performance of your people. If you don't have a performance management plan in place, you should really have something 
that's tied to the performance of your people. Do you have the people you need? Do you have the right people and volunteers in your organization? So one of the things that really um, sort of as a, as a light bulb has hit me over the last, I'd say, a couple months as I'm really looking at and strategic plan with, with nonprofits that are probably not that dissimilar a boat than, than many of you, is stop looking at things from a position of scarcity. Look at it from a position of, in the ideal word, world, if I had enough money to do the things that I needed to do to do the programs properly, what would I need? Now, not saying that you want to change the world, because of course we all do, and we are all doing it in our own ways um, with the organizations that we work with and for. But just being realistic about what is it that I that I need in order to do the best job that we can do organizationally, and then building the case for support um, and fundraising around that is is very powerful. Rather than saying, here's the only money I have, so therefore this is the only staff I can I can have, but you know what? We're just going to have to try to figure out how to do it, you know, with that with less people, or we can't we can't hire the people we need because you know that's all we got. And so, I mean, that's how we feel, and that's kind of what our budgets reflect. But if you're going through this organizational planning, I would recommend that you try to do it from a position of um, not scarcity, but from a uh, position of abundance that you have, you have the resources that you can potentially work towards the resources you need. Um, it's about organizational structure. I mean, these are pretty. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, can you outsource some things? I mean, are there people that can do some marketing and some Facebook stuff, social media stuff, marketing for you, strategic planning? Do you have to do it all yourself, or can you hire experts to do some of these things? Can you share resources with other organizations? So, you know, let's say you're in the same building. I have a client um, right now that she's in the same building with two other nonprofits, and they share um, they share an admin. Person answers the phone for all three organizations, and you wouldn't know any different. So, are there ways to, to um, become more effective and efficient that way? Do you have have you looked at cross training? One of the things that I, I see happen often is you kind of have these people that get into the niche of what they do well, <coughs> and then you potentially lose a core staff person that you need and. Nobody else knows how to do um, do that work. So now you're kind of stuck. You, you, you've got resources left left the building, and um, does anyone know how to do what they did? Succession planning is a huge part now of you know the future because of of the number of baby boomers that are in the workplace that are retiring every day. I read a statistic the other day that said, you know, every every five minutes, you know, a thousand baby boomers retire in America. You know, what I mean, it's like amazing. So, considering that in the nonprofit arena, the growth of the nonprofit sector really came about through the baby boomer generation, and most of the executive directors uh, that are there would say about 80% are in that generation. So as these people are leaving the workplace, we need to figure out how do we tap into their collective knowledge. And then the last piece under organizational structure is how do we use volunteers versus paid staff? Are there things that volunteers can do that we're paying people to do? I'll give you a good example. Um, six Sisters of the Capital Region, we um, we were asked by the city of Harrisburg to provide um, staff resources to man booths at these different you know, events, so whether it be Capona or art events or whatever on the riverfront. Uh, and you know, the first year or two we did it, we put a lot of staff time in there, and we had some volunteer time. And what we realized, like we were almost paying out as much to staff as we were getting from the city of Harrisburg, which wasn't a lot. And so when we restructured and looked at it, we said, what a great opportunity for these volunteers that are big, uh, big brothers and big sisters, and with their little, to actually volunteer at the booth and provide those services. So it kind of, you know, collided with, uh, aligned with our mission. Um, it provided us with valuable resources. It was a great way to get our word out there. 
uh, a great activity for people to do, and we were able to increase our revenues uh, and our, our take home from that by 85% or something the first year we put this into place. So it's just being creative and looking at different ways to do things. The next point is engaging and motivating your staff. Um, you know, the best part about working in the nonprofit community and, and, and myself as a consultant that was with nonprofits, my favorite, my favorite clients are nonprofits because it hits me where my heart is. Um, you already have often really motivated staff to do the work of the mission. You know, we know we don't, you know, the nonprofit staff members are not pay, being paid commensurately with their counterparts in the corporate world. And so, you know, we said, well, how do we retain these people? How do we maintain them? The best way to do it is to first and foremost make sure everybody that is on your team is committed to the mission. And then know that you have team members that are committed to the mission. Here are just some high-level tips, and, and you know these are pretty straightforward. I could do an entire uh, webinar on this point alone, but uh, obviously honest and open communication. The biggest struggle for you guys as executive directors and leaders is that you're going to have a lot of people pulling you from a lot of directions, and it's really hard to get the word out and to get everything done that you need to get out. Um, being open and being honest and, and making sure that you're communicating, communicating, communicating so that there's not a misunderstanding from staff as to what's going on. Include staff in problem solving. They often have better ideas than we do as leaders, so if we're including them, it can be very powerful. Offer alternative benefits. So this is like flex time. This is like wearing jeans on Friday. This is one day a week you get to work from home. Um, those kinds of things that don't cost you a lot of money but can be very, very powerful for staff members. Empower staff to complete key objectives. So don't give them a task and then take away the power for them to do it and micromanage. So just be really cautious about um, the micromanagement, which is so easy to do, especially when we have so much to do with so little resource. Creating a team environment, working together to come up with great ways to, uh, to move the organization forward. And provide forewarnings for changes. So we know as human beings, we typically really hate change. And so in order to, to facilitate people's willingness to engage in change, the best thing we can do is let them know that it's happening and communicate. So, you know, I do a lot of change management seminars and, and, and trainings, and I, I've worked across the world in this topic in change management. And you know what? The biggest thing you can do to make sure people are on board with you is communicate with what's going on, let them know, tell them why, have them be involved in helping you to solve the change and making the changes happen, and then empowering them to do the work. And if you can do those simple things, you've mastered change management. The next point is looking at how do we refine and our budgets and streamline our operations. So as I alluded to you earlier, that we have to really look, are, are we aligned with our mission and vision? So looking at where are we putting our money, where is our resources going, um, you know, where are we getting our money and where are we putting our money are two really important things. Looking at the cost of programs and looking at the cost of events, and did we get a return on investment? So, you know, if you're putting out $5,000 to receive $6,000 for an event in terms of revenue, and you put 100 staff hours into it, clearly you haven't had a good return on the investment that you put forward as an organization. Now, there's more than just money that ties into things. Now, let's say you only made $1,000 and you put a lot of staff time into it, but you felt that strategically it was a great event because you were introduced to, you know, a thousand new potential donors. Then that might have been worth that investment to you. Really having the opportunity to look at and developing a scorecard for yourself, not, not just on your events, but on your programs. Sometimes we consciously, from a mission standpoint, subsidize some programs that we know are lost leaders. We don't get as much money in it, but we know we have to provide that service because it's a conduit to other services. 
And I see that a lot in the disability community and a lot in the health and human service community. And I understand that. What well, what I'm suggesting is that you look at you look at how many programs are that way and how it fits into the bigger picture and make sure that overall you're not in a in a um, financial losing situation. Of course, the next question comes in: Can we eliminate events or programs and replace them with higher return activities? So, are there things that we're doing that we should do differently? And my example with the Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, is is a perfect example. So we we like the event. We weren't making money on it. How could we change it uh, so that we could and make it more profitable and more mission based for us? So um, can some services and expenses be donated? So that's you know, are we able to? Are we paying for services that we might be able to get someone to donate? And are we sharing resources and expenses with others? Maybe someone else in your building, maybe another organization that's centered stick to you. Uh, maybe it's in, in some cases I've seen um, really active organizations or companies that have been part of the board of the directors that have offered um, free office space to a nonprofit that they're passionate about. So there are opportunities to, to receive these kinds of uh, legs up. So um, share, we talked about that. And then outsourcing. Are there outsourcing opportunities for you? Can you find other people that can help you to do things more effectively and efficiently than yourself? So um, I have a lot to cover. So I just want to make sure I'm going to hit these next few pretty quickly because they're, they're pretty um, self-explanatory. I'm going to make sure that I have time for questions in about 10 minutes. So. Um, drafting your positioning statement, this is, this is your marketing. This is who are you and how do you want people to see you and how are you unique from everybody out there. So um, this is a whole marketing you know, conversation. If you can't figure out how you're different from the organization that's you know, right down the street from you that's offering similar services, you may want to consider relooking at your mission and vision. You may want to consider joining them. You may want to consider how you want to position yourself and where you want to be. So this is very action oriented and it, it, it really gives the community an opportunity to know how you want to be known. So for example, um, and this is a very brief statement, but United Way says living united. And it's two sentences, and and you know you've got the little uh, stick people, and you know you know exactly what that means. They want us to live unitedly in a community, so that's a good example of that. Um, fundraising. So this is kind of the crux of it. You know, when we think about um, funding. And you think about, let's think about your own financial positioning. So when you go to a financial advisor, the first thing they say to you is we really want to look at your, you know, your cash positioning. We want to look at where, you know, where you have your investments. And it's important that we diversify those investments. We don't want everything in one stock, for example. And that's kind of the way you need to look at fundraising for nonprofits is if you have all of your eggs in federal grants, and federal grants are being targeted right now, you could be in trouble. You may not be around for in, in the next two to three years. So what you need to do is you know, kind of look at what are the options. Some of these things will make sense and can make sense for your organization. Some may not. Events are what a lot of organizations do to kind of drive the day-to-day -day operations and to be able to bring in unrestricted funds. Um, I will tell you that events are very staff demanding and very um, labor intensive. And so unless you have a really good event or you have people that are really working it um, strongly with you and have a good volunteer base, I would think long and hard about adding additional events um, without making sure you have everything else covered on the back end. Because it's sneaky and it's surprising as to how much time and energy goes into them and sometimes how little the reward is. The number one um, donor uh, for nonprofits is the individual. If you don't have an annual campaign now, start one. Uh, you can start small. 
and you know, you, and and what we're talking about here is friend raising. You're trying to raise friends, not funds. So F R I E N D S. So how do you raise friends? You invite them to events. You have little, you know, things that that occur. Maybe it's a bagels and bigs, like we do for Big Brothers Big Sisters, or some other event that you're bringing people in the door and you're letting them know who you are. Um, bowling is a great example of individual um, donors for, for Big Brothers Big Sisters. It's a great way for people to individually give and not a lot of money, um, you know, to contribute. But, you know, one every $20, and if you have hundreds of thousands of people that are contributing, it, it adds up. You, you're already familiar with in terms of what funding streams are available. <clears throat> okay, so detailed marketing and communication plan. So marketing and communication plan, so you say, well, how is this different from the strategic plan? I encourage organizations to develop a yearly marketing communication plan, and the first major marketing communication plan or the marketing communication strategy, not necessarily the plan, the strategy is built on the strategic plan. Your marketing plan should incorporate every kind of way that you communicate externally and potentially even internally. Are you doing newsletters or e-marketing or annual campaigns or social media? Um, you know, what kind of PR strategy do you have in place? Do you have media partners? You know, are you working with a radio station or a TV station? And making sure that, you know, you are tailoring the message to meet your different stakeholders. So, for example, I'm going to use Big Brothers Big Sisters again because I'm intimately familiar with um, this component here. How we solicit volunteers to be bigs for our children is different than how we're going to market and communicate to parents of at-risk children. It's going to be also different than how we communicate to um, the children and how we communicate to the community partners and our funders. So the message has to be dovetailed and tied. Um, the, the message that we're trying to get out and what we're trying to target them to understand may be a little different. Uh, and what we want to drive them to do may be different by um, target market. The next piece is formulating strategic alliances. I can't tell you how critical this is. If you haven't looked to partner with um, other nonprofits in your community, I would encourage you to do so. This can be very, very powerful for you. Um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters in, of the Capital Region recently has, has uh, partnered with Dauphin County, we partner with school systems, we've partnered with Messiah College, we've partnered with fraternities, male fraternities, African American male fraternities in particular, who uh, can help us to bring volunteers to the table. So you can provide similar services or complementary services. Um, I, I would encourage you to do this. This, if you are doing partnerships and they're effective partnerships, and you know you can really drive funding to you. Non uh, excuse me, foundations and government entities that are looking to fund absolutely and utterly love strategic partnerships. So it's something I would encourage you to do. And I think we've talked about sharing of staff services and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, corporate alliances, let me give you an example. Big Brother Six Sisters does a corporate um, mentoring program where we uh, partner with, for example, Highmark, and they provide 10 volunteers that we bring, the kids are brought to the facility or the, or the volunteers go to the kids' school, and they mentor them once a month. And so that's a great example of Highmark saying, you know, we're really excited about mentoring. We want to support you in a big way. We're going to we're going to tap into our human resources and see if we can get you 10 or 15 mentors to mentor these kids. And for the same token, we're going to give you a little bit of cash to make sure that we can follow up with these matches and make sure they're good. So that's an, it costs us money. It's not just getting the match. It costs us money to follow up and make sure it's a good program. That's an example of a way that you can um, align with corporations. Number nine, engaging your board and volunteers. So the best way to engage people is through your mission. That's why people are there. That's why people join it. 
make sure your board members are tied to the mission or are interested in the mission. Um, talk to them about what it is. And I suggest that in order to engage um, people on the board in a meaningful way that's meaningful not just to you but to them, is making sure they understand what you're expecting of them. So communicate what you want them to do. Ask them what you need from them. And then cultivate a relationship. So each board member should be looked at as a, as a potential resource, as a potential resource to not only give personally, but also to connect you to their um, network and to um, you know, be an extension of your team to, you know, to talk about your mission. So you know, if you have board members that are showing up to meetings or not even showing up to meetings and not doing a whole heck of a lot, it's because they're not engaged. And there are a lot of things you can do around that. Again, that's probably a whole other seminar. Um, the key here is that you know communication with them um, and, and really being clear as to the expectations uh, and connecting them through your mission is really what's going to make it happen here. Don't forget to reward and thank people. Um, just having simple, simple things like you know thank you for your service or having uh, Mechanicsburg Chamber of Commerce does a Jubilee Day every year and there's about 150 volunteers for the longest you know longest running street fair in America and who who would have thought that in this teeny little town that I live in that there'd be 100,000 people that come to this thing but there are 150 volunteers that participate at the end um, you know two weeks after the event's over. We always do a, a thank you banquet and an award banquet. And it's not fancy. It's pizza at the local sub, sub shop, but a thank you uh, and a volunteer event to, uh, to appreciate what, what's happening. So um, next one, last one, monitoring results and refining. So we've talked a lot about how to put yourself in the position to uh, to create sustainability. Sometimes what we forget to do, we put all these systems in place and we don't really monitor how. So the last key tip is our, you know, monitoring. Look at it on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, not just your financial documents. We have a tendency to just you know, print out our financial documents and go over it with our board. It's beyond the financials. Let's look at some metrics. How many kids do we serve? How were the programmatic outcomes compared to what they were the previous year? Um, did we drop the number of kids we're serving in a particular area? And why and why is that happening? Uh, really looking at a balanced scorecard and a return on investment. So we had some criterion before. We talked about, you know, are we getting a good return? And we made some assumptions. Now we put it into place for a year. Let's see if it's actually working for us. And so conducting that return on investment every year or after each event, I think, is really going to be critical. And then not being afraid to pick that plan up, and that, whether it be your communications plan or your strategic plan, to look at what are some of the short-term things that we need to do so that we can meet our long-term goals. So you know we can retool pretty quickly um, as long as we know what's going on and we're looking at it. If we completely forget about it and put it on the shelf and then look at it next year, same time, say, oh crap, this thing didn't work very well. We didn't have a lot of time to retool and to do something differently. So I encourage you to do that um, more frequently than not. And then um, just you know, kind of bringing it back full circle, it's making sure that we're engaging stakeholders uh, in the, the defining of these objectives. Stakeholders being staff, board, volunteers, um, clients. Not in every component. You know, don't try to do the plan on your own. Make sure you're incorporating others to help to, to move it forward. And you're looking at stakeholders outside of yourself as the leaders. So that's for you. It's a 10 tips. It's a lot of information. Um, any any questions from the group? I see there are a few up here. Yeah, we've got a few. That was awesome, Monica. Thanks for sharing all that advice with us. Um, wow, that was that was some great information. Um, yeah. So if anyone has been maybe sitting on their hands wondering something, uh, do feel free to send some questions there through the chat. We've probably got about ten minutes for questions, honestly, and uh, you've got. A, a heck of an expert here at your disposal for the next 10 minutes. So ask away. Um, 
Looks like we got one from Sherry here. Sherry is wondering, um, with an all-volunteer board uh, that has full-time jo full jobs, how would you best manage communicating with those people? Uh, is it through email, social media, text? What advice would you have for Sherry there, Monica, about communicating okay. with the board? Sherry, that is, that is the million-dollar question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good question. Every organization that I have worked with over the last 30 years is different. So what you have to do is you have to engage them in the conversation about how would you like me to best communicate with you. So I'm seeing, for example, with Big Brothers Big Sisters, we have three levels of boards. We have a strategic board that the best way to communicate to them is through their office assistant or with them personally through their house, right? The, our core board members, the best way to communicate with them is through email, but limited email, but very targeted with really specific subject matters with links to additional information if they want it. We also have a younger board group that loves tax, social media, and everything else. So the reason I'm bringing this example up is that depending upon the board and depending upon the individuals on your board and depending upon how they like to be engaged, it will it will vary. I will I would ask them though. And it's a long and short. It's not a very good answer. I'd be uh, happy to that help you get offline. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely share Monica's contact info a, a little later on so that you guys can reach out to her. Vic here was wondering, how do you rec reconcile abundance versus scarcity planning? So if you're, you know, if you're operating out of that scarcity kind of mindset, how do you get out of that and how can you really, you know, shift your focus? One of abundance. You know, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, this is a very interesting question for me because, especially in the last probably six or seven years, with the downturn in the economy, um, all of the organizations I've been working with are operating off of a scarcity tactic. Yes. And I yeah. recently, last year, went. I uh, list last week went to um, a piano conference. And um, we're just kind of having a different set of questions, you know, the mindset of, you know, let's stop talking about what we don't have. Let's talk about what we need. So I think, if, if, you know, we're not necessarily in an abundance mode, but I think we can talk about what we need to do the jobs that we want to do. And if we're kind of looking at it from that perspective, it's easy to build a business case from where you are to where you want to go if you can justify you know, what it means, what it means to your programs, what it means to the people, what it means to the quality. And you can often, with, with that kind of analysis, you can often justify additional funding for programs, um, you know, for, for different kinds of things that you're doing as you're talking to funders. Because you're talking about it in a mindset of quality and value and you know, best, best use of their time and resource. Rather than giving you a thousand dollars, hey, if you could give me two thousand, can you imagine what we could accomplish if we had this? And this is what our program would look like if we had that additional money. I don't know if that's helpful in terms of you know, it, it's it is a paradigm shift. It's going to be something you're going to have to talk about and really think about for a long time, um, and really start having different conversations with your board. That is going to be critical. Great. Makes a lot of sense. We've got a good question here from Edie. Uh, Edie was wondering, what's the case for spending scarce funds and time and resources on strategic planning versus spending that those resources on you know your services and your provisions and things like that? How do you balance you know those resources when you you know understanding that strategic planning is important, but you've got a lot of scarce funds? Uh, what advice would you have for Edie there? You guys are stumping me, man. You give yeah, these questions. are a good one. These are really good. <laughs> well, you know, I guess, you know, you kind of look at it from this standpoint is, you know, let's just take it away from our organization. Think about it when you're thinking about your children and funding things for your children's future. You know, mm -hmm. you think about the people who do things at the moment, you know, oh, oh here's yeah. a twist. So I got to pay it, or do I want to come up with a financial strategy for the long term, so that when my kid turns 20 or 19 or whatever age they are, you know, going to be going into um, into a four-year school, wow, I'm going to be able to at least fund half of that. 
And so, so if you don't invest in strategic planning, I get it. I know that you're trying to balance the program. The problem becomes it becomes an exponential issue, right? So you might be okay for year one and year two because you're just kind of taking every dollar you have out of the bank and doing everything that you need to do. When you don't invest in the future, when you don't put money aside for retirement or you don't put money aside for college funds or for those kinds of things, we know that the future is going to be difficult for us, right? So if you think about if you're running your organization is no different than running your own personal finances, is that you want to diversify your funds. You want to have plans for the future. Can you do everything you want? Absolutely. Most people will say absolutely not. I will tell you that I, I'd love to say I'm in a great position financially for my retirement. I'm, you know, I don't think anybody feels great about it unless you're a multimillionaire. But I will tell you that I've been planning it since the time I was, you know, uh, in my first corporate job. So I have money set aside, and I put money aside for my kids, and I, I, I've, I've invested in myself. Um, and in my future um, in order to make sure I have a good future for my kids and myself. So I think of it as this. It's an investment in your future, and you have to decide at some point when is that time to trigger that. And, and maybe it's not a full-blown strategic plan. Maybe it's let's have a strategic conversation around these kind of critical components. Um, Going after grants for capacity building, those grants, every time I turn around, there's another grant for capacity building coming up with, with local mm -hmm. foundations. So the money is there. It's of changing your mindset and saying, this is important to me, and we need to invest in our future. Um, without that, I think you're just going to be day to day, and that you're going to operate that way until you, you kind of come up with a longer-term strategy. Yeah, great. Well, we've probably got time for one more question. And it's a good one here from Nicole. And I know, Monica, you got to get on the road to D.C., so I'm not going to hold you any longer. Um, but Nicole here is wondering, how do, you, how do young organizations uh, with a big impact create balance and efficiencies with limited staff? So it sounds like she's got one paid staff member and then a, a volunteer board that they're dependent on. Uh, what, what advice would you have for, for, for an organization that kind of has that kind of makeup? And um, you know, what advice would you have for her maybe five or ten years down the road? Well, I think you know, the, the exciting thing about being a young organization is Nicole, correct? Nicole? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. The exciting thing about being a young organization, Nicole, is that there's a lot of passion, it sounds like, um, around your mission. And so if you can take that passion and channel it and making sure that you're utilizing people in the ways they, they can be utilized, you'd be surprised, especially if you have a volunteer board and you have you know, people in the community that are excited about what you're doing, is really figuring out how you can utilize those volunteers to maximize their strengths. Oftentimes, we kind of hire the same kind of board members, and we hire the same kind, you know, not hire, mm -hmm. but we, we engage the same type of people that, ha that are like-minded in the mission, but maybe not be um, diverse enough from a skill standpoint to bring you more. So, so what I look at is I look at, how, you know, who are you engaging to the volunteer component now? How do you engage them? How can you grow that engagement? How can you get them to bring in others in their core areas of strength? And then what you've done is you've built an incubator um, for your organization for future success. You've built committees and you have groups of volunteers with, with different areas of expertise that can then help you to grow strategically, align together. And then as you do that, you, funding will come and staff will come and build upon that. So it's, it's a stair-step approach, but, uh, you know, but really figuring out how best to engage the people who are excited about you now is, is really, I think, your biggest opportunity there. Cool. Do you think that people should, should invest in, in actually hiring full-time staff or, or just continue on with volunteers? It seems like if, if your volunteers are working and if you're managing them correctly, you know, that kind of makeup is fine, but when do you think people should invest in full-time staff? 
you know, I, I, I struggle with that. I think, again, it's dependent upon the mission and it's dependent upon the organization. Um, you know, if you, for example, with Big Brothers Big Sister, because we are working with children and connecting children to volunteers, we absolutely, from a mission standpoint, have to have paid staff. Yeah. We need to have accountability and drive accountability back to our staff. We can't have we can't have that match support effort and all of that happening by volunteers. We can have the the mentoring occurring by volunteers, but all of those sort of accountability components have to be staff members. So, right. so the answer is it depends upon the mission. It depends upon what you're trying to accomplish. I will say that what happens with organizations that are just volunteer driven is that often it's driven by two or three key people in the organization, and when they burn out, there's no more organization. Right. Yeah. So you gotta you gotta figure out you know short term it's fine long term it's not a sustainable model in order to ensure um, you know long term viability because every time you get a new leader in there that's a volunteer volunteer board member they change the whole thing you know right oh we're gonna start this way now and so you don't get any sort of key organizational learning um, that takes place and that that continuity tends to to be lost so yeah. I mean, that's sort of a long answer. This is sort of, it, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's great. Wow, this was awesome advice, Monica. Thanks for hanging out with us for about an hour and, and sharing all your knowledge. I hope everyone, you know, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, just, just in the few seconds we've got remaining, uh, where can folks find out more about you? I assume people can uh, email you, call you? Yes, yes, yes. I have my contact information on the screen. Um, we are located in central Pennsylvania, but I work with organizations across the country, uh, actually across the globe. Uh, we have done um, all kinds of operational and strategic planning assessments and, and organization assessments for nonprofits on a small scale or a big scale. So, you know, we, we, we um, will work with you for a couple of hours if you just want some advice and want to talk through some things. Or if you want to go through a, a full-blown strategic planning process, we can do that with you. Uh, we have been very successful in helping the nonprofits we work with, garnering funding for our, our ASCII building services. So, you know, what, if, if, if there is an interest in that, we'd be happy to provide you with a pretty comprehensive proposal of what that would look like. And often, um, you can utilize that, that information to actively go after grants uh, for those services. And I would say one out of every two of the clients that I've worked with in that capacity have received funding. So don't feel like you're out there by yourself. Um, we're mm -hmm. willing to invest in you if if the foundation, if you know, if you can, uh, if you scare up at least the internal resources to be able to do the work. Because I will tell you, it's more than just funding, and it's more than just our time. It's it's your time too. So you have to be willing to to invest in that to make that work. But overall, we'd be yeah. happy to help. You. Um, we're, we're available and you have our contact information. Uh, please feel free to go to our website too. I don't have that on there. It's, um, it's www.yourstrategicconsultant.com. So you can see the Monica, but it's just a www.yourstrategicconsultant.com. And it can outline a little bit more about our company and, and all that good stuff. So we've been doing this for 20 years. It's our 20th anniversary. And uh, we're excited. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we just uh, we're, we're turning 20 in September. We're not 20 yet. We're, we're still uh, we're still on our team. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, do reach out to Monica. Work with her. She's awesome. Uh, obviously, you know that after hearing this great presentation. Um, so thanks again, uh, Monica, and thanks again to everyone who hung out with us for a little while today. Uh, we do do these webinars once a week. We've got some really awesome webinars coming up uh, the rest of May. So check out our resources section. Uh, if any of those topics interest you, you can register for them. They're totally free and totally educational. So check those out. Um, well, great. This was awesome. Thanks for again for uh, joining us, everyone. Uh, I will be sending out a recording a little later this afternoon as well as the slides. So I'll look for that to hit your email. Uh, other than that, have a great rest of your afternoon, and we will talk to you next week. Bye now. Thank you, guys. Bye.